You know, as we get into the Lord's Prayer, we can see that it's beautifully crafted. Well, duh, right? It's the prayer that the Lord gives basically to his disciples, right? And when you go through it, you see that there are some conditions in there, uh, but it's not a condition that's so advantageous to God. It's conditions that are advantageous to us. And we're going to look at that in just a minute. Now, when Jesus gives this prayer, and it is not to be rote, we know that you're not supposed to just endlessly repeat it, but it's kind of a guidelines to ideas, attitudes, the direction that you're going in your prayer life. And you can pray other than this, right? And you can pray uh, without ceasing, as Paul says. So you, you can, and there's tons of different prayers in Scripture but this is kind of a guideline to what God is expecting from our hearts, right? Not exactly that way because he wants something genuine from our heart. But speaking of our heart, right? He wants our heart right. So let's go through this prayer. It's in Matthew 6, 9, starting with verse 9. It says, In this manner, therefore pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So we dealt with the previous verses, obviously. We're down to, you know... Basically, forgive us our debts. We've already touched on that a little bit. But in the sense of that we need to forgive debts on two things. One is, when he says this, understand when we say, Lord, forgive us our debts. The reason he asks us to say that is because he's willing, he's exceedingly willing to forgive us. To show mercy to grant us those things that we need to sustain and maintain that fellowship with him. And so when he says, hey, you need to pray and ask for forgiveness for your sins, it isn't so I can clobber you for your sins. It's that we can clear that path to him, and he is abundant in mercy. He's just waiting to extend mercy. And so it's a powerful incentive for us but it also gives us this sense of, I guess, um, that we have a indebtedness to him. He's not indebted to us, right? So we can have this entitlement mentality, this victimhood mentality, where we're just owed all this, and God must answer our prayers, and he must come through for these things. He doesn't have to. He will keep his word, so if you ask for forgiveness of sins he is faithful and just to do so and cleanse us from unrighteousness if we're really honest and sincere in asking for that cleansing right and that forgiveness but these other things aren't guaranteed this is one of those conditions that when we ask for forgiveness of sins we come with this humble spirit not an arrogant spirit right we can have this idea that I'm entitled, God owes me. Look, and that can come from a sinful background, like I'm somebody special and I'm, I'm, you know, someone granted into the kingdom of God. Most of us don't have that attitude. But sometimes an attitude will creep in like, well, God, you know, I've done really good and I've cut back my sins and, you know, I'm hardly sinning and Lord, you know, uh, I'm obeying your word. So therefore, he owes us one, right? Lord, you, you owe us this. 
uh, because we have an expectation we're going to receive for doing what's right, doing what's normal, right? When, and when I say it that way, it's like, yeah, your kid's not, not behaving properly and not fighting with one another. Well, that's just normal, right? That's not over the top. That's that. Well, it's not normal that they're not fighting, right? But it would be a benchmark of that would be average. That's what we at, at least expect of you is that you obey your parents and you're not fighting with your siblings, right? That doesn't mean you, you know, and now we're indebted as parents to grant you that pony. Uh, that's, that's not how it goes. We kind of have this Santa Claus mindset in our mind sometimes. And he's like, hey, no, I, I'm very aware of your sins. I'm very aware of you doing good. It, it doesn't buy you cred. I love you anyways. So God loves us anyways, and he wants to offer the blessing. He wants to offer what's good for us. And in this, we've got a, we, we need to have that sense of like Peter had in the boat, right, where they pushed offshore and they caught in this big bounty of fish. And he didn't feel like he was owed that. Matter of fact, he was humiliated in a good sense, right? Humbled in a good sense. His spirit was brought low. He, he felt like, Lord, whew, I'm a sinner. I don't deserve this, right? I, I'm not even doing the basics let alone this thing. I'm a man of unclean lips. Like, I say things I shouldn't. I've, I've cursed. I've sworn. I've lied. I've given false witness. I've done these things that, that Lord, you need, you know, you need to not bestow these things on me because I'm not worthy. And see, God's the opposite. He wants to bestow good gifts on us. But he doesn't want us to have the attitude where we think we're owed that. And that's where this comes in with this bit of humility. And so when he talks about in Matthew 6.13, And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. He's, um, what is he saying here? It almost seems like, eh, sometimes it doesn't translate really well from another language to English like from Greek to into English. Because the idea here is that don't lead us into temptation means don't lead us where we have, don't allow our hearts to get astray. Don't allow us to go down a path of sin. You know, protect us from the enemy and from a mindset that would take us on a course other than your perfect will. And that's like, saying your will be done on earth, right? But also knowing that our hearts, you know, can choose something that's wrong. We can think that it's right, but it's wrong. We can decide that, um, you know, we listen to the flesh or we listen to the world. We listen to the enemy and they, it can be hard to manage and maneuver this sometimes, right? And, you want to have a, a position in Christ that you're open enough that we are yielding in our hearts enough to say, Lord, if this isn't your will, please shut the door. That's a, for some of us, that's a hard thing to, to say and really mean, Lord. You know, because certain things we really, really want and we think it's right and we, we're determined that it's right. But it may not be the right time, it may not be the right place, it may not be the right person. And God says, no, let's, let's nix that. Let's say that this, I got something better for you, or I have, or I'm going to push this off for a little bit because there's something going on here that I've got to work out with you or with circumstances. And trust me, right? So he's not putting us in an area of temptation because James talks about this in James 1 that, God doesn't tempt. He, he cannot tempt. God can't sin. He can't tempt with sin. So when we're tempted, it's by our own volition. It's by our own will. It's by the things that start in our heart. And when it's born, it, it comes forward as, you know, as sin. So in our heart, we're plotting or planning. 
at any time we could say, hey, I'm not going to go through with this, but we allow it to mature <laughs> and then come forth in our mouth or our actions, our thinking. And James says, no, that's, that's not of God because he doesn't tempt. He doesn't do these things. Matter of fact, there's another verse. In 1 John 5, 8, it says this, We know that whoever is born of God does not sin or seek sin, practice sin, you know, that, that's his lifestyle. But he who has been born of God keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. So what he's saying here is that those who are in Christ, those who are walking with him, they are not allowing... The enemy, constant victory, that we, we are fighting against it. Now, sometimes we fall, new Christians, older Christians, sometimes we have a habitual sin, but we're fighting that and fighting against that, right? And then a lot of other sins we do just eliminate from our life or are fighting and getting control and victory over, right? Someone who's in the world isn't really focused as much on that as much as they are well, what works for me, right? And if lying will get me out of the situation, then I'm just going to lie. Uh, not everybody, right? But the world is, has a penchant towards evil, towards the easy way, towards those things. And the Christian's not supposed to. And he says, if the Christian is that way, then that Christian has this uh, ability to overcome the enemy, to stay out of the enemy's traps, stay out of some of these self-inflicted trials. And the power of this, <clears throat> and the power of this is that we can bring about, um, in this prayer, bring about an attitude, this condition of, Lord, help me to be ever watchful. And then help me to listen to your promptings when I've got a blind side or something's happening and I'm just not focused enough on what um, I should be. And I'm leading myself into a place where temptation, a trap, sinfulness, these kind of things can overtake me. And I don't want that because God said he's given us a way of escape in each one of these areas. So in knowing this, as we go through the Lord's Prayer and you're asking for your daily provisions and these sort of things, he brings us to a place where we're also asking for protection. And here's the comforting part, because yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power, right? Forever and ever. So God, we submit to you. We bow the knee to you. And we know that you can come through for us in protecting us. And doing these things because you are all powerful. And you have our care and our concern in your foremost. We know that's because of your sacrifice of your son. And if, if you love us and you, you have the power, then you're going to do what's right for us. Doesn't mean we escape every trial. Doesn't mean that we escape death. Uh, in one sense we do, right? We die, but we don't really die because... We're resurrected into a new body. It's kind of more of a transition than, than an ending. So that's how we can trust and we can say these things and relinquish our heart to Him and forgive debtors as we forgive and trust Him for our daily position, uh, provisions because He's loving. It's His kingdom and he, His kingdom lacks no resources or power. All right? Man, that's so good. So... Uh, I hope you're getting something out of this. I'm surely enjoying this as we're going through the, you know, the Beatitudes and then into farther into uh, the Sermon on the Mount. So good stuff, Maynard. All right. God bless you. See you next time.